Hello, and welcome back to In Conclusion, We Have No Idea. I'm Camille. I'm Liz. Ba 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 ba. I really feel like the intro needed a little spice today. It, it really did. It needed it. <laughs> uh. so. so, Camille, how was your week? Oh, it's been fine and dandy. Uh, I went to a friend's house. Me and my boyfriend went to a friend's house for dinner on Sunday, and we got a text message on Tuesday saying, hey, we're exhibiting mild symptoms of COVID, so we went to get tested. So you guys may want to quarantine. And I was just like, ah, oh, dang. I knew this was going to happen. I just didn't think it was going to happen before class even started. So I have classes haven't started? Not yet. We don't start for, like... We don't start till Wednesday, but yeah, you probably should be, it's been nice. But yeah, so I was just trapped in my room for two days, but their test came back negative. So we're in the clear, everything's fine. Wear your gosh dang masks, people. I mean, like my baby Yoda mask that I yes. have with me right now. No one can see, but it's here yes. and it's adorable. It's fantastic. <sighs> what do you use to cope, Camille? What do I use to Just cope? Just out of curiosity. Because you've been in your room all week, other than all of your Instagram stories that I've seen. Um, well, I got to leave my room yesterday, so... But while I was in my room, I actually just watched Legend of Korra and planned my D&D camp. Listen, I, I love Legend of Korra so much. Oh, I do too. I hope you know. I loved it. I don't understand why people hate it so much. Like It's mostly the misogyny. That's true. That's fair. And you know what? I'm going to say it. I'm straight, but Asami can get it. Asami can get it with practically anybody. It's true. Myself. It's true. Well, here's the thing. So, okay. Have you finished it, though? Yes. Yes, I have. Okay. So you know that Korra and Asami are a thing. Yes, and I love it. Perfect. Love it. I... Oh, God. Every time I think of that show, all of the women are just so amazing. <laughs> Anyways, that's not what we're talking about this week. Yeah. We're not talking about all of my um, loves for every single woman in Legend of Korra, even though I could go on about that for several hours. But this week... <laughs> D&D. D&D. Yes, my only other co- Or D&D akin things. Yes. Um, Liz plays actual D&D. Me and my friends, we... We can't figure out D&D, because there's a lot. So we picked, like, a simpler version of D&D, where it's, like, still all the same moves. It's... But it's mostly roleplay heavy. Um, Monster of the Week. Which, um... I'll go over the like, kind of the differences real quick. Monster of the Week, it's still a role-playing game. It's a lot like D&D, um, but um, you don't have to pick, like, a race if you don't, like, you don't have to, like, be, like, a gremlin, not a gremlin, a goblin or an elf or a human. You can, that's not, that doesn't really matter to your characters at all. If you want to do something like that, you absolutely can. Um, I, I know that one of my friends, when I DM a campaign, literally just wants to be a talking horse, and I told her to freaking go for it. Um, but um, the classes are a little different, like... Centaur? Um, no, literally a talking horse. Nothing human about her. Just a talking horse. I see. I see. It's, it's amazing. Um, but, so, our classes are a little different. Um, for example, I've played the Crooked, which is kind of like the Rogue. And I also played the expert, which is someone who just knows a lot about monsters and stuff. It's, it's pretty cool. And then you have, like, certain moves that you can do. Um, but then there are, like, only five basic moves. Um, charm, which is a lot like charisma. Cool, which is how you, like, act under pressure. Um, shark, which is basically how you investigate. Tough, which is how you, you know, fight. And then weird, which is magic. So it's, and 
really the um, so that's like those those are pretty much the big differences. Um, and then the other thing is the DM is supposed to be on your side, but we all collectively decided that that was stupid and that the DM should always just be trying to kill you. So that's how we play it. But yeah, I play D and D in like the DM is just kind of there help facilitate the story, not some help. Well, that's a lie. My DM first game made it a point to just like really try and fuck with me and my character, which was super fun. Yeah, that's always. I say sarcastically. Um, I... but it was mostly just me specifically. It wasn't necessarily anybody else in the group. It was like, yes, Liz, I'm singling you out right now. I always give my DM way too much backstory to work with, um, which I'll go into in a little bit here, but um, let's just say for my first character, I wrote a 15-page backstory, and boy howdy, did she use it to absolutely destroy me. And she threw in her own little embellishments of things that would hurt me, and then the person who DM'd after her, that I'm, I'm in his campaign right now, he was like, hey Camille, you, you're totally allowed to keep it simple. I'm like, absolutely not. Here's my 20 page backstory, ruin my life. And I, I'm just gonna keep Perfect. it. I'm just gonna keep doing it. Cause I'm kind of a masochist, I guess. That's fair. That's, that's fair. Um, my first character's backstory was like three paragraphs because this whole thing ended up where I was like just joking around with this guy I knew on a on a game that I play ESO, and he was like, "Oh, so you like?" Because we both like watch Critical Role, which is an entertaining show I enjoy. But he was like, "Have you ever played a game of D and D before?" And I was like, "No, I haven't." He's like, "Well, you can join my campaign. We're having another session um, on Wednesday," which was like four days away and I was like <laughs> so I like over like the course of like four days had to create a character make up a backstory and like all of that stuff so my first character a little lackluster on the backstory side but I actually really liked her when we ended up playing it was um pretty entertaining we made it to level six and then stopped because that was the end of the story, but hope I can bring her back someday because she was pretty dope. See, that's somewhat similar to the way I actually got into um, D and D. I'll just call it D and D for simplicity's sake. Um, it was at the beginning of lockdown, like back in March, when everything just fell apart. Um, my boyfriend mm -hmm. and, and our other friends were all still in College Town, but my parents were like not about that, so they took me away. So they all started playing um, D and D, and my boyfriend would call and talk to me about it. And I was like, "Man, that sounds like fun." And he's like, "We've still got room for one more player. I can, I can talk to our DM about it." And the DM's one of my really good friends, so he was like, "I'll talk to her about it, and we'll see if we can, let, if we can squeeze you in, because we're all getting sent home anyway." I was like, "Okay." Right. And it consumed my entire life, so, yeah. I don't think it's consumed my entire life. It's just been something that's been kind of nice and, like, fun for me to do. Just kind of, like, I end up doing it every other Wednesday. Um, yeah. Which has been kind of a consistent thing. Well, we originally started it every single week during the beginning of quarantine, but then stuff kind of started, like, returning back to normal. And also the... <laughs> DM lives on the East Coast, so I'm two hours behind, yeah. obviously, um, since we're at uh, mountain time, but it's it's been, it's been fun. I have had the pleasure of um, also annoying the hell out of everybody in my group by playing the kazoo. Nice. Because <sighs> I play... The second campaign we're on now, uh, I play a kazoo bard. Well, it's a bard, but her instrument of choice is a kazoo. Because I, when we were playing ESO, I used to like joke around and threaten to 
play the kazoo for everybody because I have a fancy metal kazoo that I I feel like is going to refuse to break on me no matter what I do to it because I've like chucked this thing against a wall and it still kind of sticks around. So they were finally like, why don't you just play a kazoo bard for D&D? And I was like, hmm, that sounds like a bad idea for everybody else, but a great idea for me. It'll entertain me. I think it's a bad idea for your guys' sanity, though. And they're like, no, it'll be fun. You know? It's been fine. <laughs> so far. Yeah. See, my characters just annoy everyone because the second they're asked about their backstory, like the second, um, the second someone's like, hey, character, can we ask you about this particular thing? And my character's just like, let's change the subject. And... Oh, I see. So you're the moody, broody type. A little bit, yeah. And everyone's and it's gotten to the, like, even in this campaign, um, they started asking, because um, there was a big plot twist in our last campaign regarding my character that I will probably, again, talk about once we start talking about that stuff. Uh, and so everyone found out about, so when that happened, so then in this campaign, they were like, hey, do you, you know this person? I was like, no, why would you ask that? And they're all just like, okay, so let's think back to Astrid for a second. Um, and now we're going to talk to you out of character. Camille, you're kind of dramatic. And I'm like, really? You think? Yeah, see, my character is, um, the first one I played kind of just like a, not just a dumbass. Just chaotic, not even chaotic stupid, just regular stupid. But not like himbo kind of stupid. Just like makes dumb choices and doesn't think about consequences. Versus my character for this one is just so much all the time. Just I, I mean, I played the song that never ends on the kazoo at one point. Um, that was entertaining. She loves this, like, little owl bear cub that they met along the road to where they were going. His name is Ghost, and I love him so much. And maybe that's just me projecting onto the character, but I really think that's how the character would react. But she's more of, like, an emotional mess kind of thing that's, like not even like broody about it it's just like outwardly like i'm gonna have a mental breakdown i'm gonna go walk over into the trees and cry loudly for like 10 minutes and just do that you know my other character mm. was just like i'm gonna jump off a building because i think it'd be fun also mood also mood like that yeah but the thing is my so my first character i ever played uh her name was callus she was a wood elf monk. Um, originally, I was supposed to build her, like, so her class is, uh, like, her monk. I don't remember what the name is, but uh, the Way of the Shadow, which is basically, like, a ninja. But um, she ended up not being super great at stealth, even though um, she had a plus, plus seven to all of her stealth rolls. Which is very high, given the fact that we were, like, level four when this was all happening. And I would consistently roll, like, ones and twos for stealth, so it doesn't matter if you're only rolling, like, an eight for stealth no matter what. So that didn't end up working out for me as well as I had hoped it would. Uh, she was built for stealth, however, which is the real tragic part of everything. <laughs> but she... Um, within the course of a week in that campaign got like sliced open by a robot fell off a windmill jumped off a building almost got like ritually sacrificed by a cult and then fell off a cliff in like the span of like a three days to a week so everything happened all at once for her and i felt a little bad 
and the DM and I laugh about it all the time. She also, um, for people who know D&D, was attuned to the stone of Go Golor. I think that's how you say it. Golor. Which is like a sentient rock. And, um, I played that whole thing as uh, me talking to a rock named Mr. Rocky, is what I named it. And on the stone, he was like, my name's Golor. And I was like, I'm going to call you Rocky, Mr. Rocky. Uh, which really just goes to show how much of a dumbass that character was. Because um, if you become unattuned to the rock, basically you can just lose all of your memories. So, you know, she really, really was just so intelligent. So so stealthy and not um just a fucking dumbass all the time you know we love characters like that honestly like i've decided my favorite character type that i've seen people play in dnd &D are characters who are high intelligence low wisdom like characters who like know a whole lot of things but are simultaneously the biggest idiot alive. Like, cause partially just because I relate. I relate hardcore. Because, like, I know a lot about classic literature, and I've got a very high IQ. But I didn't know Manhattan was an island, so... Well, it's like me. I <laughs> can do multivariable calculus without an issue. But for some reason, in a conversation talking about parts of the legs, I insisted that the calf was the same area of the leg as the shin, which is factually very incorrect. Yeah. <sighs> so I understand that. Just being a fucking dumbass, but also, like, knowing things, but not understanding things. I think it's the yeah. difference. Yeah. And speaking of characters who are incredibly intelligent, my first character, we didn't actually, and this is going to take a while, because, like I said, I have a real problem with backstory, and this is just a very fun campaign, so I will sum up what, because what happened is we got, um, like, nine arcs in and a typical monster of the it, it can really go as long as you want it to but we've decided for simplicity's sake and for the sake of all of our sanities that we're going to switch off dms and we're going to mm -hmm. keep our campaigns to like somewhere between 10 and like probably like 13 sessions just to keep it just so everyone gets a chance to dm and so that um, people don't lose their minds. So this first right. campaign, I joined three arcs in, and my character's name was Astrid Lancaster, and she was an expert, and what had happened is the rest of the party had been picked up by this organization called the MPA, and her family was killed by a werewolf when she was 13. So she basically kind of got adopted by this organization. And they kind of like raised her as their own and raised her to be a monster hunter. So she joined these people, they started hunting monsters. Um, a half demon in the group turned on them because his dad told him to and tried to kill the hot wizard in the group. And Astrid, who's never had a boyfriend in her life, was like, dang, that guy I've known for three days is pretty sexy. I think I'm gonna save his life. And then they started dating. Um, and that... The, As you do. And it's... But the, that kind of happened because the person playing the wizard was my boyfriend, and he and I were like, wouldn't Obviously. it be funny if our characters just started flirting in-game? That'd be funny. And so we started flirting in-game, and the DM was like, okay, guys, you guys are officially dating now. And we're like, huh? Our character... Yes, you're dating. If you guys are going to flirt, you guys are going to have a full-on romantic relationship. Love that. Which, you know, we loved. We loved it. Um, and then we basically found out during another session that the MPA was actually evil and mm. was 
like manipulating the world, which is very difficult for Astrid, obviously, because these are like the people who raised her, and they're evil, and they're trying to kill her because she's good. And so then they land in her hometown, and they end up right by her house, and she's found a note that says, I found you, which she's like, the werewolf found me. And through a lot of investigation, everyone's figured out, hey, Astrid, is your older brother the, the, the werewolf? And that's when the whole, no, what are you talking about thing happened. And then everyone was like, okay, yeah, he's the werewolf. Um, and he's still alive, obviously. Because the basic background with her family is that she was always, like, second best to her brother. Um, mm. So, and she was, like, trying to prove that he wasn't perfect so that she could, like, get the spotlight for a change, and no one would believe her. And then he turned into a werewolf and killed everyone and tried to kill her, but she got away. And, yeah, she just kind of carried that secret with her. And then, uh, defeated the werewolf, had to kill him. Then there were Wendigos, and then Hot Wizard's family oh, died. Um, then we went to a children's museum. The children's museum arc was actually really, re it was probably my favorite arc. This is actually where we finished off. Um, basically, all of these kids in this children's museum were kind of like trapped in like the world between worlds because a robot, like an, an artificial intelligence, was trying to kill them. And I love that. the artificial intelligence actually like affected, like, was trying to kill us too. And it actually killed the half demon. And we resurrected him, but he was, he was, he had amnesia. He could not remember anything from the past few months. So his dad took advantage of that and was like, hey son, you need to kill all these people. They're in debt to me. So he was trying to kill all of us, and basically we were finding these kids. We were freeing them and putting them in like a safe room. And Astrid was very good with kids, ironically, because, you know, she had a lousy childhood, but she was good with kids. I don't know. And so long story short, Astrid kind of got trapped alone with the kids. And the half demon either killed or trapped everyone. And Astrid was so upset that she kind of just started gabbing him. And then one of the other players who was still like alive had freed himself and was like, you can't do this. And I was like, he killed my boyfriend. That's all I had left. And he was like, you can't do this. And then he kind of vanished, zapped himself into his oubliette, which is like, a safe place, kind of, where he trapped another character. He's like, hey, go kill Astrid. And she was like, okay, that's a super open-ended order, so I'm going to say that I'm not going to kill Astrid immediately. I'll wait till she's 90, and I'll unplug her life support. And then she left the oubliette. And then the AI reappeared and was a evil unicorn. And we discovered, hey, if we do good things, we, like, overpower her. So then me and the hot wizard started making out, and we all told Half Demon that even though he'd, like, committed war crimes against us, that we still loved him. And all of his memories came rushing back. And basically, we defeated this evil unicorn robot by being nice to each other. And turned Sounds out... Sounds like a, like a really fucked up cartoon. <laughs> it was. It was. I cried. I, I'm simplifying this because it was it was it was a lot. I cried like twice the entire time in this one arc because I was so emotionally overwhelmed. We resurrected boyfriend, by the way. Don't worry. That's how we were. I, I figured, given the that, fact that you made out with him by the end. Yeah, yeah. It, I I wasn't just making out with a corpse. Uh, but yeah, and then we were all just like, okay, we got to go take down the MPA, and then. The nice robot was actually the evil robot, but the evil robot had been corrupted. I mean, the nice robot had been corrupted, so by being nice to the robot, it was suddenly the nice robot again, and she gave us all nice things. 
So now my character has fire powers, and she's already a pyromaniac. All of my characters... Well, that. All of my characters are pyromaniacs. It is, like, a consistent character trait. And I've told my friends this. I'm like, every single character is going to be a pyromaniac. I'm sorry. But, yeah. So that's... Really something about you, Camille. It really does, actually. Like... <laughs> I was at a wedding a couple weeks ago, and they had matches and tea candles as the party favors, and everyone was very concerned that I was even matches. So. I wouldn't blame them, honestly. You know, it, it was a very fair concern. At any rate. Yeah, it's valid, and you should say it. Yeah, yeah. At any rate, that's where we left that campaign. We're probably going to resume it after we finish our current campaign. Yeah, it's a fun time. Basically, did a real bad backstory and suffered greatly for it, and then I did it again. So, yeah. My my first campaign, my character's backstory was um, I was determined to not kill the parents because I was like, you know, D and D trope: the parents are dead or they're disappeared. Or something like that. And I was like, I don't really want to do that. I mean, obviously, I'd switch some stuff up later. But for this character, I kept the parents alive, made my character, like, a major kleptomaniac. Like, had, like, a huge issue, kept getting arrested. And so um, one day she just kind of was, uh, just got arrested for, like, one last time. And she felt so bad and she didn't want to face her parents again that she just, like, um, broke out of jail and then left and didn't say anything to her parents ever again. Um, well, I mean, at the end of the campaign, I, she ended up going back. But uh, when she left, she kind of was, like, on this trail, and she met, like, this wise old monk dude um, who kind of taught her about self-defense and stuff, which is how she became a monk. And then she met this other guy whose name was uh, Varric, and Varric taught her, like, about, uh, kind of shadow arts, which is the class of monk that she was, is a shadow monk. So, she ended up, since I joined a little bit part of the way through the campaign, um, the rest of the group had basically got this tavern that they were, uh, operating out of, um, and my first session, I showed up, and they were like, we need to get behind this brick wall and I was like does anyone have any ideas but I just I saw two crowbars in my inventory so then that became a thing where I just dual wielded crowbars everywhere I went I just hacked at the wall and killed some rats with some crowbars and then I was like oh you have a quarter staff no you don't now you just use crowbars anytime you want to do anything <laughs> which is really great um, but basically the whole point of this was there's going to be like a, like a heist in, in this house where, um, you would get this, the stone of Golor was the thing that we were supposed to be, like, uh, getting from the house, and it was supposed to help us find this, like, really, like, big wealth of treasure, um, but in the process, we went to, like, this noble house where, um, there was a robot that had gone on the loose, and I had to fight the robot, and then the robot, like, almost murdered my character, and that was fun. Um, and then we met some cultists at a graveyard, but they were in, like, a windmill, and so I was like, oh, I'll just climb up the windmill on this window, because I'm a monk, so I could do that. <sighs> but then my low stealth made it so that I slipped and I fell off of the windmill, and I hit the ground, and the cultists, we had to fight the cultists, and, um... So one of the other party members basically, like, shot an icicle through one of the cultists' eyes during an interrogation, which was really weird. But the important thing was this masquerade ball that we went to. And for this masquerade ball, we were supposed... That was where the heist was supposed to happen. And it was at this really, like, rich, richy, rich, super rich mansion for, like, this... Kind of, probably, mostly, definitely, 100% evil, like, noble family. So, 
we go in and my character was supposed to go to the top floor because I had the highest stealth. And at this point, since I was a shadow monk, I could cast like Pass Without a Trace, which is like a plus 10 to your stealth. And I was like, I am fucking using that because I have rolled shit on stealth all campaign and I want to do well here. So we go upstairs and everything's fine, la 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 la, just like going through. I made it through all like the rooms and our bard was sent to like do a distraction. So she was playing Bohemian Rhapsody on the piano downstairs and like the main banquet hall. It was great, it was fine. Everything was going well. Um, I get the stone and then I, as I was leaving the lady of the house, was in the bedroom that I had to go through to get to the study that had the stone in it. And um, even though I rolled a 24 on my stealth, she still saw me, which was unfortunate because it's like the first really good stealth roll that I had had all the campaign. Um, and so it turns out she was an evil cultist and also like a demon lady. And so she charmed me and was going to sacrifice my character. Like, straight up was just, like, in the process of, like, painting runes and stuff and was, like, chanting. Um, but then the bard had managed to, like, get into contact with me and then didn't hear a response. So she came upstairs and body slammed the evil lady onto the ground and then we tied her up with like a rope and I like whacked her in the face with the crowbar because again the crowbar was a running theme for that whole campaign so I get this heist done I have the stone I'm supposed to attune to it that's when I started calling him Mr. Rocky um and we go through this dungeon kind of underneath the city that we were in um because that's where the treasure was using the stone the stone told us where the the treasure was and we get to this part where you're supposed to like walk across this giant chasm um but like face your biggest fear or whatever for your character um and my character had so many fears i suppose and so on one side of the chasm was like my character by herself and then on the other side was all of like her mentor figures and stuff which i interpreted as like oh i need my character needs to learn to be okay with asking for help and be okay with like like facing her past and everything apparently that was the wrong choice because i fell off the cliff and i started falling and then i was like yelling at my dm i was like i thought i was like i swear to god that that was me facing my right here he was like no it was supposed to be you um you like learning to um, be okay with like doing stuff by yourself or whatever, like being independent. And I was like, that is not what I thought it was. And so he gracefully allowed me to hit a like a like a little cliff edge. And then we ended up getting the treasure, so everything was fine, but it was like, in the span of like a like a week, she got sliced open by a robot, fell off a windmill, almost got ritually sacrificed. She threatened an archfey with the crowbars as well, and then on top of that, fell off of a, a, a chasm and hit a fucking, not, she didn't like perpetually fall for forever but she fell enough that like I took like most of my hit points away <laughs> but I still got the gold and so my character ended up with like over a hundred thousand gold at the end of the campaign which was great but at the same time like at what cost she went through so much you know you get money at the cost of like your emotional state just like real life it wasn't even like all of like the emotional stuff was that like, it was just like a series of unfortunate events that all managed to happen within like a week. So like everything was fine and like we had stretched out everything in this campaign for a very long time, everything was great, la la la. But then it was like that one week <laughs> that everything went wrong in 
and then the campaign ended after we got the treasure and everything, so I never really got to resolve all of all of that stuff. But I was like, man, imagine just like having like a perfectly like just fine life. Like obviously you have like emotional issues and stuff, but like for the most part, it's it's okay. But then all of a sudden, shit just happens, and it just happens all at once in one week. Well, that's it, and then it's fine again. <laughs> like that's fucked up. That's kind of like the summary of almost every single D and D campaign, really. Like, there's always at least one character that's like, you know, I've had a pretty great life, and then they get like just roped into this adventure. Kind of like, kind of like Bilbo Baggins in The Hobbit. Like, he's like, man, I have a pretty great life, and then he just gets roped into this adventure, and. The next couple of years of his life are just real whack. And then he goes home, and then he's just like, okay, that was fun, I guess. And that's it. It's just like, it's not like, I mean, obviously she had stuff in her background, like, she was still upset about. But, like, I feel like every single person in their life is like, yeah, I guess there's things in my childhood that I, like, regret or whatever. And obviously getting arrested a ton is not great. However, like, relatively speaking, her parents were alive. She had money, she had a consistent job, she was doing stuff with her life and didn't feel like she was, like, you know, a detriment to the world or what. I mean, she was a criminal, so she was stealing shit, but obviously, like, it was still working for her. But then, you just really get fucked up for a bit there. Yeah. <laughs> and it... I, and then all of a sudden you're rich and like everything's back to normal and you're like do I just have to like act like none of that just happened because all of that happened all at the same time and I don't know where to start in trying to deal with that yeah yeah that's it. that's just that's just my life right now like I was fine and then COVID I really and then I'm just like okay I really feel like that week for Callus, my character, is just like a metaphor for 2020. Like yeah. everything was like fine. Everything was fine. Like it still kind of sucked a little bit from like 2016 to 2019, and then everything just fucking happened in 2020. Yeah. And hopefully, by that logic, that means things will improve and go back to like some relative normalcy after. But we're all just going to have to deal with the collective trauma of the year 2020. You know, that's fair. That's fair. And Just so yeah. fucked up, though. See, and that's why I love playing D&D, because it's like, I get to take a break from my real life stress and be distracted by fictional stress. Like... I'm like having a full-blown mental breakdown over these fictional people. But it's still preferable to having a full-blown mental breakdown over real-life stuff. You know what? That's fair. And honestly, like, I don't know. My second campaign, I haven't had to deal with the backstory of my character yet. Oh, I um, have. But the, the bard has a very sad backstory, <laughs> which is why she's, like, constantly in, like, a state of, like, I'm gonna go have a mental breakdown and cry in the woods, like, I'll see y'all in, like, ten minutes, but I'll be back. Which is what, it's, I, I, I think we've managed to play it off, like, pretty funny, but no one, no one's asked me about anything in my backstory, which is fine. Like, I think we're probably, like, maybe five sessions into the campaign and my DM's like well this is probably going to be about a year long so like be prepared for that so I was like well I don't need to reveal the very very depressing backstory I mean obviously if you want to hear it I'll tell you because none of my fellow players or DM listen to this at all so with the bard for as much as she plays the kazoo he's fucked up man so fucked up. So, you know, that's fun. Um, her brother, she is a twin brother, 
he disappeared when they were 16. That was, like, her best friend in the whole wide world. Like, you know how, like, twins are, like, really, like, tight, tight? Yeah. Yeah, so her brother disappeared when she was 16. No one knows where he went. And then she got super depressed, met, um, and this is just, like, a summary, met a, uh, a lady working with, like, an entertainment troupe, um, who gave her her lovely trusty kazoo and um because you know my bard her name's ariadne she was very talented as a child um but once her brother disappeared she just kind of gave up like music and entertainment and just kind of worked at a bar but she ended up deciding to go with this lady who had given her the kazoo and go touring with the entertainment group um and she was sending letters to her family back and forth and then one day she just stopped getting letters from her family so she convinced the uh the leader of the troop to go back to her hometown and when she got there like the whole town had been burned and everybody had been like murdered including her whole family her whole family was murdered and stuff which is so fun to have to like figure out how you're gonna play that off um especially because this this campaign is about dragons and fighting a dragon cult so I feel like I kind of um, know where the DM might take that information. But her whole family had been murdered, including her little sister and her other older brother and both of her parents. Um, and so she kind of went into like another really deep depression and then left the entertainment troupe and was just kind of going around trying to figure out something for herself to do where she met um, this group of adventurers and they on the first night they were in this town the town got attacked by uh some dragons and dragon cultists and she killed some kobolds the little lizard people yeah. and I, for some reason uh in my head i just started like saying something on the lines of like i just killed like a trench coat worth of kobolds and i was like fuck are you talking about? And I was like, three kobolds in a trench coat. One trench coat of kobolds is three kobolds. And so if I kill two trench coats worth of kobolds, that's six kobolds that I just murdered. And so that's now a thing that we just, like, measure deaths of kobolds in trench coats. <laughs> so the DM's like, so you have six kobolds in front of you. I'm like, two trench coats worth of kobolds like there's two trench coats worth of kobolds in front of you so that's just become a thing now i don't know why i just started yelling about kobolds and trench coats um but then she got left in the dragon cult camp like they were gonna go infiltrate the dragon cult camp and like it was gonna be like everyone's gonna go in together um but then the other two characters at that point rolled really 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 high stealth and my character did not so, I got found by some, some dragon cultists, and they were like, hey, what are you doing? And I was like, oh, I am, I am with the cult. Yes, me with the cult. But I also have very high charisma, because a bard. Yeah. So, that worked out really well in my favor for once. And so then I just had to, like, I was in the cult camp, I didn't know what to do, and I was by myself. So she's still really mad about the fact because the other characters didn't really do anything to help her. So now they are on the path towards a city to go tell someone what the cult is up to. And they met a guy on the path and he had an owl bear with him, but it was like a little owl bear cub. And he was so cute. He was an albino owl bear. And his name is Ghost, and I rolled a natural 20 on animal handling, and so Ghost loves me, and honestly, that's the best thing to happen to me this campaign. Nice. But that's where we're at at that point. Nice, nice, nice. See, I don't, it's just really weird to me that you're like, oh yeah, this campaign's gonna be like a year. And then there's me, and I'm like, I'm halfway through my second campaign, and we've only been playing since March. So that's just, that's fun for me. But yeah, we are- We're- 
We are currently in the middle of, I think we're like exactly halfway through a campaign. Um, and my character is drastically different because Astrid was just me with a lot more trauma. Um, right. And then I was like, you know what? Screw it. And here, I have to say this because this is the funniest thing. So we had only one like evil quote unquote character in our last campaign and that was the half demon. And he is now DMing. And we all, on our own, without talking to each other, collectively decided, you know what, since he's not playing, I think I need to be the chaotic force. So now oh. it's just completely chaotic, and, like, we have terrible morals. Like, we have all, like, we've got a plague doctor who just frequently steals people's organs and limbs. We have an assassin. We have, like, the world's most notorious thief. That's me. We have a Viking who just got transported through time, and I think he killed someone. And then we have a psychiatrist who slept with one of his patients, which is, like, a big no- I feel like that's the most chaotic of them all. Honestly. Uh yeah, it's just, it's a fun time. Like, our poor DM, I'm pretty sure we've dragged him to his wit's end. Like, he sets up, like, all these fun little things for us to find. And then we just, like, don't even find them. Like, we just, like, immediately just, like, start blasting. Like, because it's set, like, steampunk Victorian, so we've all got, like, guns and they stuff. They do that, like, video of, like, the Danny DeVito meme. So yeah. anyways, I start blasting. That is literally, I have a blob of, I make memes after every single session of what happened in the camp, like, what happened that week. And I literally have picked my favorite, and I've made, like, a blob on the wall in my bedroom in my apartment of just these memes. And I think, I think, yeah, that's one of the memes. I and, feel like I need to show you, or not show you, like, read you my notes from my sessions. Oh, um, and it's, it's sitting across the room from me right now. I'll be right back real quick. Entertain the people. Tell them a story. I love I, I need to, I need to show you these. They're pretty great. Anyways, so, long story short, when I say short, I mean it won't be short. But I'm trying to think of a way to, like, explain Nicolette. Her name is Nicolette Sinclair. She's the world's most notorious criminal. Um, we've all taken to calling her the Mafia Queen, even though before this, she didn't really... Hold on. I'm on my earbuds in yet. I will. I don't. Oh, that's cool. I'm just talking about what's happened in our campaign so far. Anyways... So, I'm trying to think of the best way to tell her backstory without giving everything away, because my boyfriend listens to this just, podcast. Just if, it's like, if it's, like, devastating or not. Like, be vague. Okay. I, we've got part of it revealed. Anyways, while she was working for with her gang, um, I'll reveal what they already know. Um, while she was working with her gang, this guy asked her to steal a very... Because what happened is they started just stealing for themselves to survive, but then they got really good at it, so they started, like, stealing super expensive things for other people for money. So she stole this, um, like, priceless diamond necklace for this guy who was like, I need it to impress, um, I need it to impress a girl. And she was like, yeah, I don't really care, because she doesn't care. So she stole this necklace for him, and then this, so that was that. Um, then this patron came along, and he was like, I need you to go steal a book from this guy. And they were like, yeah, okay, whatever. And they never, she never bothered really learning the names of her patrons, because she didn't want to be, like, held accountable. Um, so she went to steal this book, and then she discovered that it was the guy who she'd stolen the necklace for, and that he was marrying her sister. And she didn't like that one, because... Um, she was, she, she's a pretty tough person, but she has a soft spot for her little sister, and she was like, and she knew, she was like, if this guy had to ask someone to steal, like, a priceless diamond necklace for him, he's, he's not good news. 
So she was like, you know what, forget it, I'll just steal the book, I'll get out of here. Um, so when she went to steal the book, though, this guy caught her. And she figured out that he was a vampire who was planning on um, turning her little sister after they got married. And she tried explaining this to her sister, who basically called her a liar and just told her absolutely not. And so then she just grabbed the book and ran. She was like, you know what, forget it. If my sister wants to get eaten by a vampire, that's her problem. So she ran and she took the book to this guy and was like, I'm done with monsters. I want no part of it. He's like, oh no, I think you do. Because that vampire's going to be looking for you because you stole his book. Also, keep the book. Here's the money. Good luck. So she left her gang and took the book and was like, yeah, okay, I'll go fight monsters. She wasn't really going to. She was going to run for dear life. And that took us up to the that took us to the beginning of our campaign, where she meets all of these people on a train. And she is connected to all of these people. So the plague doctor once attacked her and stole some of her blood ones, but they put that aside real quick. They're just like, yeah, you know, it's been a couple of years. I think we can move past that. Um, and then you're like, you know, is the need at that point? Um, it's, you know. It's like... It's like, yeah, that's a thing that happened. Um, and then there's a very, the assassin is like a countess. And I, and I robbed her once. She is not aware of that fact. I'm aware of that fact. The Viking, I'm not exactly sure how he and I are connected yet. And then the psychiatrist and I have, a, have an on and off friends with benefits relationship. Oh, were you the one that he slept with? Uh, no, I was not the patient he slept with. I was just some other chick he slept with. And that's a, actually, that actually becomes a very fun plot point. So, on the train, there are these people who are murdering people. And we figured out real quick who it was. And we just killed them. Murder train. And the DM was actually very disappointed. He was like, they were going to, like, actually, like, do things. And you just, like, you set them on fire before they could even do anything. And then we went oh, to... I've been in that situation. Yeah. But, yeah, so that was a fun time. And then we went to this teeny tiny village and where the men were basically... This man had been murdered and then this girl had been murdered and there were evil... evil willies, which are like... I don't know. You just have to Google what a willy is because I don't know how to describe it. Um, and we ran into this other guy that Nicolette used to sleep with, who was in love with her, but then she was like, whoa, I thought we were just, you know, having sex as friends. I didn't realize we were like, I didn't realize you liked me. And she was, she's got a deep fear of emotion. So instead of actually being honest and saying, hey, I don't really like you in that way, can we move on? She instead got him arrested and he went oh. to jail. So Love that. He wasn't too happy about that. Um, so they. I didn't know I wouldn't be either, honestly. You know, but it, it was fair. Nicolette's not a good. It was person. fair. Um, so we blasted his arm off, and by the time we were done in this town, he was like, "Look, just leave. Like, I will give you anything if you will leave." And I was like, "Hey, just don't tell anyone you saw me." And She's like, whoa, whoa, hold on. So you're saying that if I never have to see your sorry face again, you'll do whatever you, you'll do whatever I want? Yeah, and she's like, sweet, this is a win-win situation. Let's pack it up. I should also mention that Nicolette did die during this session, and they had to bring her back to life, because unlike Astrid, she exhibits no caution and will run directly into danger and get murdered. But then after that, you know, I can understand that we actually went to another town where we met the patient that um, the psychiatrist slept with. And it actually like really bugged Nicolette for some reason. She was like, I don't know why I'm so bugged by this. Like, not like he and I actually like had a relationship. We kind of just slept with each other. Like, I don't understand why I'm bothered. And 
the count, and this girl is just like, did he ever tell you he loved you? And she was like, oh no, I'm in love with the psychiatrist. So Nicolette is coming to terms with the fact that she actually assume, has emotions. Can I assume that the psychiatrist is also played by your boyfriend? Yes. It's a real problem. Yeah, I could, I could kind of, I could kind of guess that. Just, anyways, she, she didn't realize it. It's like kind of like one of those things where it's like you don't realize that you like someone until you have competition, and then you're like, ah, oh, wait a minute. So we had to kill like, that uh -huh. chick because she like had evil magic powers and was using her evil magic powers to manipulate people into murdering other people. So, as you do. Yeah, we had to kill her, and the psychiatrist was like, "Oh, I did love her, but you know, she was doing bad things, so it's fine." And then my character goes, "Well, there's plenty of fish in the sea," and the countess and the plague doctor, who are just like. They're Nicolette's like besties, both just go, hey, hey, not every day you get to have an affair with the Mafia Queen. He goes, no. So then Nicolette was just mad at him. And she was like, I shouldn't even be mad by this. This is stupid. So Nicolette's just constantly in a war of herself where she's like, I should not be upset over a man, yet here I am. And then we actually went to the town with the vampire. And he was, like, terrorizing this town because he was looking for my sister. And I was like, ah, sweet. She got away. She listened to me. And we basically fought this vampire, and I was like, this is what you get for trying to marry my sister. And he's like, oh, I married your sister. And I'm like, what? How dare he? And then he's, and then the, the plague doctor very timidly goes, so did you uh, do anything to um, her sister? And he's like, oh, when she found out I was a vampire, she begged to be a vampire. So I turned her into a vampire. And then she... What? And so then I killed him because I was very upset. And so now we have no idea where my sister is. But we do know that she's, like, communicating with bad people to do bad things. So... I love that. We went to a masquerade ball where we met the um, patron who asked me to steal the book. But it turned out he was trapping people's souls in paintings. So we set his painting on fire, and consequently he got set on fire. And we burned down the entire house. Nicolette tried- Love that, even more. Nicolette tried to seduce Dimitri again, and he friend-zoned her again. We found one of her old gang members locked in a room, and we had to rescue her, and she's going on about how we need to find her baby. So we're pretty sure she screwed a demon. And yeah, that's where we're at. So obviously this campaign is much more chaotic than the last I mean, thing. Let me, I, I can read you the notes. The notes that I take for, they, uh, I skipped a session in the middle there, but um, this one, I think you can kind of understand. Not, it's it. not chaotic necessarily so much as it's just like confused. We're all confused. So the campaign we're running is called Tyranny of Dragons. Um, and I don't know, have you ever seen the Skyrim opening, like, sequence? Yes. Yes, I have. Yes. Okay. So when we opened this campaign, our DM started with that, and he's like, oh, I see you're finally awake. And I was like, so my first note is, fucking Skyrim opening. <laughs> ah. And then, um, I go through and then... We get to the town, and I say, the town is on McFucking fire. I suck at sneaking regardless of campaign. Kobolds, six of them, Thunderwave, baby, killed all the kobolds. At least two trench coats worth of kobolds. Um, killed eight more kobolds in total, two more for my character. Saved some children, I guess. Immigrant songed some rats to death. Like... Because, you know, my kazoo, I played the immigrant song, and that was... And then I said, indecisive motherfuckers, are we? Uh, a blue dragon, what the fuck, we're gonna die. A uh, blue dragon guy, and then I, I don't know how to say his name. Uh, prisoners for a fight, no thanks. Okay, so the blue dragon guy came in and was like, he had all these prisoners as citizens. He's like, okay, I'll give you these prisoners if one of you fights me. And so... The, one of the guys that was in our group fought him and then died immediately. 
So that was fun. Uh, so we're all pissed off about that. Um, and then I say, I know my limits. I'm not about to sacrifice my kazoo bard right now. Oh no, why? Kronk is dead. That's the end. The fuck. And that was the first session. Oh, wow. Uh, and so the next one is Kronk and the elf are dead. There's a woman, short, black hair, and purple robes. And then I just didn't write anything else for the next two sessions for some reason. I don't know why. Um, and then we got uh, a few more characters in our campaign. And this is where the great notes are. So it starts. So we got the guy back. We went into the cult camp to rescue a guy, which is why I got stuck in there. Um, and then I say, I used a healing spell. We go to a tent. I'm still mad about getting left behind. A healer lady is running around the tent. And then I spent, like, the next three lines trying to figure out what the name of the character was. And I still don't know actually what her name is or how to spell it. But she's one of the other players. She's a cleric. And then um, one of the other new players was having really bad internet connection issues right at the time he was being introduced. So... I just wrote, oh my god, the Goliath is dead. No alive. No, he's dead. No, he's alive. Because he kept reconnecting and disconnecting. Uh, his name is Toph. And Tass, go find out what the cult is planning. We have no plan. Ambush some patrol guards? Question mark. Ambush is the only idea. I go outside and sob for a hot second. We go to the cult camp. I don't understand. Like, Let's see. It's that blue dragon bitch. Shattered some dragon eggs. Whoopsies. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, this is bad. In all caps. I died. Which is the next line after, oh no, this is bad. I got rezzed. Dragon bitch is dead. Mistakes were made. I have regrets. I think we were supposed to follow them. This is one bumblefuck of a group. Good night. And that was the, uh, that session. Um... And then the next one was, first line is, LOL, sorry. We found a piece of parchment on the dragon bitch. There was a Tiamat statue in the cave. We go back to the town, um, talk to the mayor. One of the other characters named Gray, who's a tabaxi, which is like a cat person, almost curb stomped a child for a cart or kidnapped him, maybe an orphan. Cleric lady chilling with us now. None of these make any sense. Uh, and then the last session was... Ignore the big scary cat thing. A humanoid with a puppy. That's not a puppy. It's an owl bear. His name is Ghost. I love Ghost. He's amazing. I'd die for Ghost. Threatened to punch Marsalik in the dick for Ghost. We were on the first watch. Ghost was asleep on my lap. I love Ghost. Woke up with Ghost on my lap again, polished my kazoo, and then we got to the town we were going for. I forgot to mention at one point we did almost curb stomp a child to get a cart. I feel like that really kind of encapsulates the kind of group that we're in. Because me personally, I was like, my character won't hurt a child, but I won't actively stop someone from hurting a child. That's <laughs> Which sounds really fucked up when I say it, but at the same time I'm like, that's it's how, a child. That's how Nicolette is. The only two people she's, like, actively murdered, like, this is, like, some... The only two people she's murdered are psychiatrist's ex-girlfriend and the vampire, and they both had it coming. Because she's, like, very much, like, she's, like, I don't want to resort to, like, murdering people unless they deserve it. But then when other people are, like, I'm going to go murder this person, she's just, like, okay, have fun. So... She won't do it. So, she, she doesn't care if other people do it. We When we fought that dragon guy, the blue dragon guy, he was supposed to be a reoccurring villain. Um, That didn't happen. He died. And our DM was kind of mad at us for a bit there because he was like, this was supposed to be a reoccurring villain, you fucking dumbasses. You were supposed <laughs> to follow them. I was like, I don't think to point out the group several times if they had a plan, and nobody said they had another plan. I'm just saying. And he was like, yes, but you're the one who instigated the fight. Because basically what had happened is we were sitting in the, like this field, and there was like a cave all the way on the other side of where we were, and the cult was packing up some stuff because they were just moving like their massive camp that was there. 
and we saw them from like a super far distance and our whole plan was we're just gonna ambush them so we can like steal a bunch of their stuff and then follow the other cultists so that we can follow the cult wherever they went or like sneak into the camp or whatever um problem was is I didn't realize until it was too late that <laughs> the guy that had fought one of the other people in our party and killed him was the same guy who was at that cart at that point and so I cast Shatter on the cart and Shatter will just basically just like explode any inorganic material which meant the cart exploded which meant that the dragon eggs on the cart exploded, which meant that this dragon guy was pissed the fuck off. And um, there was a party of like seven of us. No, there's six of us in the party. And it was six of us versus this one guy and a bunch of kobolds and other cultists. And really, I didn't realize the group was that big. And also, like I said, didn't realize big dragon guy was there. And, you know, there was a point where he almost killed all of us, and we almost just, like, team-wiped on, like, our third session. And we ended up killing him because our barbarian rolled two natural 20s in a row. So he just really fucked him up there. But, man, I done fucked up. I done fucked up real bad. Yeah. Well, so then we didn't have a way to follow the cult. We didn't know where they were going. Because the only way for us to figure it out was dead and exploded and or dead and exploded. So mistakes were made. Um, but no one else in the group gave a better idea. I was the only one coming up with ideas. So really, I think it was a group mistake. Yeah. Yeah. See, our GM has kind of just figured out that he can't give us any nice things because we won't ever find them. So he's just like dumbed it. He's like, I wouldn't say he's dumbed it down, but he's made it very simple. He's like, here are more people for you to murder, and here are less things that you have to investigate. So, and you know what? It's actually been. Because we always, at the end of every session, we do, like, a recap. Like, he mm -hmm. over things that we missed. Things that he had, like, planned that we didn't get to. Um, and so that's actually pretty fun, actually. And it's gotten to the point that when we missed things he was really excited about, he's like, so there were a couple of things I was really excited about that I'm not going to tell you about because I've decided to just throw them in a future session because... I was excited, and you guys just ruined it. Ruined, ruined everything yeah. with your ruiny ruinness. It's like you guys and your stupid chaoticness, just your trigger happy pyromania nonsense, just ruin everything. So, and you know what? He's absolutely right. He's right, and he should say it. Yeah, I mean, that was the whole thing with RDM. After the whole we almost jumped a child incident, he's like, I think I might just retcon children out of this entire world. <laughs> he's like, I'm just going to remove all of the children. And I was like, I'd like to point out that I tried to stop her from curb stomping a child. I tried. It took several people to get her to not curb stomp a child, but attempts were made, and we ended up not curb stomping the child in the end. So personally, I call it a success. And he was like, the fact that you were thinking about that worries me. I'm like, you're saying it as if I was thinking about it. I wasn't thinking about anything. Head empty, no thoughts. I was just vibing. He was like, Liz, Liz, you need to think more. And I was like, my character doesn't think. Like, she has average intelligence. She's fine. Everything's fine. And he's like, well, what if I say that the child looks like your little sister? And I was like, okay, that's fucked up. Don't fucking do it. Not now. It has been, like, five sessions, dude. Not now. Wait at least a little bit until we jump another child in another city. Then you can use that. 
but at least be patient about it. Yeah. Yeah, you're like, hold on, we don't need to, we don't need to get into that just yet. We've got some time. We have plenty of time for us to almost jump another child. Be patient. Another opportunity will arise. However, you can't go back and say that that child looks like my little sister, especially when we made up the child that we found by ourselves and we just went... Because <laughs> the whole thing was me and the character Gray were walking down the street trying to find a cart. And Gray, we were just talking, and all of a sudden she goes, hey, look, we can take it from that child. And the GM was like, what? There's a child? And we just kind of started going off and being like, yeah, we might steal from this child. And I was like, well, maybe not steal from the child. And then Gray was like, no, maybe he can just, like, kidnap him. And our barbarian was there, and he was like, yeah, I'll just, like, put him in this, like, really large tarp that we had bought. And I was like, we are not kidnapping a child. And then everyone was like, well, what if he's an orphan and he just, like, wants a family? I'm like, we're not giving this child a backstory, are we? Like, are we really doing this right now? And everyone was like, I think we should kidnap the child. And I was like, absolutely not. I do not want to deal with a child on the trip that we are about to make. And everyone was like, oh, so it's not about you don't want to kidnap the child. You just don't want to deal with the child on the road. And I was like, you have my exact point being made. So we didn't touch the child or kidnap the child or curb stomp the child or steal his cart. However, we just made up a child on the spot there and the dm was like i think i'm gonna revoke your your um <laughs> your privileges to be in the same group together like because we had splintered off into like little side groups and he was like gray and uh ariadne aren't allowed to be together in a group anymore and i was like um i'm sorry i refused to kidnap the child and he was like not for any moral reasons and I was like do you think I'm a moral person thank you yeah yeah it's funny I actually email Caitlin every week I give her her voice recording and I always do a recap of our monster of the week session and do you send her voice recordings or do you send her emails I send her voice recordings because Typing. No. Typing. And, uh, I send, and she, I didn't realize she liked them so much, but one week we didn't play, and she, like, was very distressed. She's like, are you guys still playing? Are you guys still playing Monster of the Week? I'm like, yeah. Why? And she's like, oh, I was just very sad that I missed it this week. I'm like, what? Oh, yeah, it's like the missionary Netflix. Me and my companion love it. I'm like, okay. So I did have to leave out. It's because she doesn't have any other form of entertainment. Yeah, yeah. I did, however, opt to leave out a part last week where I accidentally started an orgy. I did not participate in the orgy. I just accidentally started an orgy. Okay. I feel like that should be the name of this video. <laughs> So this episode, I accidentally. <laughs> that's it. That's that's the title of this podcast. I I accidentally started an orgy. I didn't participate. I just started one. Does that? Uh, that's just that's what D and D is. It's just accidentally doing things, and they either improv, baby. Yes, it is actually. I'm an improv performer, and let me tell you, D&D has actually been super helpful with, like, honing improv skills. I kind of want to do a one-shot and have the improv team, like, play a one-shot D&D campaign. Because I think that would be very helpful to them, because I love them, but sometimes they feel like every single line needs to be funny. So it's just punchline after punchline, and it gets super out of control real quick. So, that's, I'm glad you mentioned that. But, Thank yeah. You. Uh, Thank you. I, I really was thinking that the episode title was going to be something about curb stomping a child, yeah. but I really think that um, accidentally starting an orgy is a better title, honestly. Yeah. Yeah. 
it's a, it's a good time. It is a good time. Anyways, I was going to say something about Caitlin. Um, she pointed out a couple weeks ago, she was like, you know, I think Nicolette should stop chasing after Dimitri. She can do better. I'm like, you realize, you, re you real. she's like, Dimitri's just not a good person. I'm like, you realize Nicolette is not a good person either. She literally can't do better. Because if she met someone who literally was a better person, they'd be like, you're kind of a terrible human being. I don't want you. This is the best. You're not. They'd be like, I can do better. I can do better. Yeah. You're not supposed to like Nicolette. She's kind of a terrible person. I don't usually like Nicolette. And I created her. Like, I like her in a sense of, I created you, you're chaotic, you're fantastic, you're, you're, pardon my French, you're a badass. But then I'm also like, you're literally like letting people get murdered. She literally just sat there one time while Dimitri was getting murdered and was like, eh, we can resurrect him, go ahead, kill him, whatever. And you know, it's funny, my boyfriend will actually bring that up sometimes. He'll be like, hey, remember that time you just let the plague doctor murder me? And I'm like, honey, yeah, I do. But that was Nicolette, not me. If you were getting murdered in real life, I would stop it. Murdered in real life. <laughs> no, I, I understand. I, my problem is, okay. So in my campaign, Ariane is emotionally a mess. She cries a lot. Um, but the cleric is like this older dwarf lady, and the lady who plays her, she's like, Ma, the dwarf cleric is basically like a motherly figure, and she just feels really bad for your character. And I'm like, that's probably valid because, man, Ariadne is just pathetic. Just so... she So, the dwarf cleric felt so bad for my character that she um, had, like, a bunch of, like, wrappings for, like, bandages and stuff. And she made, like, a little bandage teddy bear out of the wrappings and gave it to my character. And my character just started sobbing. <laughs> right there on the spot and um i think i think the uh, dwarf cleric has kind of adopted mine um which is super funny because i've been talking with the dm and he's like so what would you think about betraying the party and i was like i mean i'd consider it and he's like because i'm thinking of having you just like secretly join the dragon cult and actually like be a cultist and be part of like the big big bad end game <sighs> no one's gonna hear this i hope um but i was like what an interesting idea but now that like all of a sudden my character's just been like adopted by this old dwarf lady i don't know how well that's gonna work out like betraying the party or anything uh, I'm still trying to decide whether or not that's an avenue that I'm like, oh, yeah, sure, I'd be willing to explore, or if it's, like, something that I'm like, uh, I don't know. But um, if not, and if my bar dies, which she probably will, I do have a backup character <laughs> I worked with with the DM, and it's probably my, like, favorite concept for a character that I've ever had. So it's this tiefling warlock which um you know what a warlock is right yeah yeah so she's a tiefling warlock but her patron is her mother <laughs> but she just has really bad mommy issues but not because of like her mom was like horrible or terrible her mom is just a smother who's her patron and so it's like my character the concept i've discussed this with the dm is kind of something along the lines of like oh yeah my patron is just like a demon from the nine hells she's just super just terrifying and horrifying and just so scary but then like the party will meet the the patron eventually and the and um her mother will be like oh, 
I just miss you so much. You guys never, you never come and visit. I miss you. Like, I have such cute pictures of her. Like, like you know, like a smother. Yeah, yeah. But the party's like, man, your mom's super hot and also, like, really cool. And my kid, the warlock's gonna be like, no, she's, like, terrifying, y'all. Like, it's just so scary. Just the worst, like, overbearing kind of patron in the world. And the mom is just, like, a fucking smother. And I, it's just, like, the funny, like, you know, when, when your mom embarrasses you and you're like, mom, not now. Mom, not. Oh, mama. <laughs> Why? Not now. Uh, I'm a little busy. And the mother's like, I just wanted to, I heard you guys were in town and I was really hoping that you would stop by. I, you know, I, I got some sweaters ready. She knit sweaters for the party. <laughs> that's, that's a character that I really want to explore. Probably if it doesn't end up working out this campaign, I'll probably do it next campaign. Right. But I thought that would be... Like, that's a backstory that's like, just kind of funny like it's not even like deep or like dark or anything it's just low-key like relatable but also just kind of hilarious it's okay i have a character plan for um i think it's going to be for my boyfriend's campaign his campaign is going to be kind of like star trek doctor who kind of feel it's going to be in space but i am going to play a bard x character but instead of like singing or playing an instrument, they just do stand-up comedy. Perfect. So, I'm excited for that, and it's, I always find it interesting when people are like, oh yeah, I've got a backup character, because in D&D, in D &D, if your character dies, unless the DM is like, you know what, you can bring your character back, your character's just dead. But in Monster of the Week, we have like an entire page in the book dedicated to resurrection, so unless you don't want to bring your character back, you can always bring your character back to life. But there's always like a caveat, like you might mm. lose, you might lose some advantage or um, gain some advantage. You um, could wake up like depressive. It's like there's always like a caveat to it. So, like I know when. Um, Dimitri died in our most recent campaign. Um, his caveat was he woke up depressed because he just got murdered by one of his friends. Um, then there was like in the last campaign when the half demon died, he got resurrected, but his caveat was he was am he had amnesia. It's kind of so it's really interesting when I hear other people are like I've got a backup character. I'm like oh. If my character dies, I've decided that they're going to come back with, like, magical powers. I, I didn't realize that, okay, okay. Yeah, for me in d, &D like, you can res people in d, d You just have to, like, be at a certain level. Uh, um, it's just a matter of keeping your characters alive until that point. Yeah, yeah. So, I have concepts for characters that I'd like to play in the future you know I, I have ideas and stuff but this one I'm kind of interested to see how it goes because you you know you're talking about how you know, you're gonna make a bard that's like a comedian who does like stand-up comedy mm -hmm. my bard kind of is like an insult comic a bit who can just play the kazoo amazing so i just like fucking roast people the whole time and also play the kazoo but then also cry in the woods so i really think that it's um an all-around all kind of well-rounded character <laughs> she also has a british accent that i really can't seem to get down i've been working on it for so long but every single week it changes <sighs> it changes like dialect and location like it's just yeah it's not gonna work. I, I don't know. What it's, I keep telling myself that it's gonna get better, but then it never does. So, well, you know, it happens. It do be like that. It do be like that. Yeah. I, like I said, I don't know. I'll never know. I have no idea. 
We have no idea. And that, I feel, I feel like that's just the theme of D&D. We have no idea. D&D is just a series of just being like, well, I got no idea what's going on here. We'll just figure it out, but it's consistently just, I, I have no idea what's going on. My character has no idea what's going on. We're just out here trying our best, not knowing what's going on. Yeah. You know, sometimes you just gotta commit arson and figure out your life. I don't think I've committed arson, but, um, I have committed petty theft, grand theft, um, middle theft, and also almost jumped child. So... Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> could be worse, though. It could be worse. It could always it could be, worse. be worse. I haven't accidentally started any orgies, so... Yeah, yeah, I have. The way that orgy started was hilarious, actually. I feel like this is a good way to conclude. I feel like everyone needs to know. So, I was dancing with Dimitri, and I was trying to seduce him. And I, I was like, I don't know why I care about you. You don't care about me. And he said, I do care for you. And she goes, really? And he says, yeah, I care for everyone in the party. And she was so upset that she stepped on his foot. And he, like, pushed her away because, you know, she was stepping on his foot. And they both just got shoved into individual crowds of people who immediately started groping them. And they both broke away because they weren't about that life. So then everyone just started having sex with each other. And they were both just like, we're going to leave now. So that's how I accidentally started an orgy. Because I was petty. I really hope you didn't tell Caitlin that. Oh, I didn't. I didn't. I was like, oh, oh. thank God. And then, she, and then she stepped on Dimitri's foot, which had absolutely no consequences. Moving along, that like is a direct quote from the email. So, I did not tell her. I See, now I'm like, I don't know if I should tell Caitlin anything about what I do in my D and D campaigns because she's just gonna be like, Liz, you should see your therapist about that kind of stuff. Oh, oh, the DM has told me to see a therapist several times, and I'm like, I already do see a therapist. See him hard. Like, this is already something that's happening. I don't, don't worry about it. No. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Wow. We clearly had a lot to talk wow. about. Wow. <laughs> that was quite a chain of events. Yeah, have no idea where that came from. But, yeah, if anyone is interested in Monster of the Week, if you're interested in D&D, you can find it anywhere. But if you're interested in Monster of the Week, I will link the link to the book and stuff in the description. That's, yes. They're not paying me to do that. I just, it needs more appreciation. And I'm sick of people calling it, like, the easy D&D, because you're not wrong, but you don't need to be patronizing about it. Camille, I'm going to get you to play actual D&D. You can... You can. Uh, I mean, I know you enjoy your game, but I feel like you, if you understood D&D, you'd enjoy it, too. I'd, I'd be down. I'd be down. I would be down. Anyway, I can DM a one shot for you guys. I don't know. Yeah. That can be but. that can be my wedding reception. Just the D and D one shot. Camille, I okay. Well, we can discuss. Anyways, in conclusion, I have no idea because this has been so many things all at once. Yes. So, so many things that I have to think about now. And so many things that all 12 of you have to think about now. Well, 12 is an overestimate, I feel like. We usually get like, like 12 views. We're like three. Okay, fine. All three of you now have a lot to think about, and you can all be concerned for our mental health. So, yeah, in conclusion, we have no idea.
Cue the funky exit music.